Stanford University. Uh, thanks. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, I haven't even been born when this departed department has started, but I've been here for a couple of years um, working at the intersection of the InfoLab and the AI Lab, and I can tell you about kind of the work uh, that it has that we've been doing in in my research group. And really, the way I would start is to say that today, as kind of Alex nicely mentioned, uh, technological networks that we in created in computer science are intertwined with social networks of humans that are using our systems. And maybe the best way to characterize this was, was this quote from uh, Jim, Jim Gray's uh, Turing Award address where he compared the emergence of cyberspace and the World Wide Web as with the discovery of, the, of a new continent. And as we basically built and discovered this new con continent, this had a profound impact in, in the transformation in how we think of computer science, right? First, in a sense of how knowledge is globally produced and shared, how we as humans interact and communicate with each other, and it also um, in, in increase the scope of computer science uh, as a discipline. So really, if when we are building applications that are being used by billions of users across, across the world all, all the time and allowing new types of interactions and new types of um, services, there are several kind of core issues that arise from the point of computer science. So the first one is how do we think about designing in this space, right? So today's computing applications are about social interactions. They allow for voting reputation mechanisms. And in some sense, one user's experience depends on the experiences of the others. So the question is, how do we design? How do we build better applications in this new, new space of possibilities? And the second question, the second issue central to the computing is whether, whether these systems, in some sense, the, can act as sensors into humanity and whether we can recognize fundamental patterns of human behavior th from these raw digital traces of user activity, right? And in some sense, whether new computational models can address uh, long-standing social science questions. And these are really kind of some of the central questions that, that my um, research group has been uh, working on for the fast, last few years, right? So kind of what's the point? The point is if we really want to build better applications that will be used by billions of people, then we need to understand patterns of user activity in these systems so that we can design for them and we can anticipate them. And in order to make progress on this question, we need to think about how to combine social science models with core ideas from computing. Right? Everything from understanding complex social networks, how to design them, analyze and model them, how to um, work with algorithmic game, game theory and think about designing with incentives, and also think about social media, notions of reputation, recommendation, and a notion of contagion or virality of this information that is being kind of filtered by social crowds. And what I would like to do in the remaining few minutes is to tell you uh, about two research projects that we've been recently working on that kind of show the, the breadth of what we are doing. So the first question is, how do we design with incentives, right? For example, and the incentive mechanism, I'll, I'll be using an example here, is this notion of badges, right? When a user does something, you give them a little badge next to, the, next to their picture. And badges are um, kind of extremely common, right? We use them in, in science to recognize awards. Uh, Army uses them to recognize special achievements. Various kinds of websites from education to Wikipedia are using badges uh, to motivate their, their users, right? And badges are interesting because they play two roles, right? They recognize a wide range of activities, and they can also serve as both credentials as well as uh, incentives for users to do certain things. So the question is, right, how do badges translate into effects on user behavior? And here we worked with the world's largest question answering website, uh, Stack Overflow, where basically people can come and ask computer programming related questions, other people can provide answers, people can upvote the questions, people can upvote uh, the answers. And as people are doing this, they are getting badges, right? You get a newbie badge once you uh, contributed your first answers, you can get a superstar badge once you answered 10 questions, and so on and so forth. Right? So the question is, how would we build a utility-based model of the behavior under the presence of badges? And here is how we proceeded. So the way to think about this is, you think that there is some action space a user can take on the website. And every new user starts at the bottom left corner, and then when they make an action of type A1, they move to the, to the right, and if they take an action of A2, uh, they move up. Right? And we can think of badges now as boundaries in this space. And whenever a user will cross this boundary, they will, get, they will, reserve the, they will get the badge. They will, 
kind of enjoy the utility of it. And we can also think that users are born with some kind of preferred behavior, right? So this user really likes doing the action of type two, but doesn't like doing action of type one too much. And what the user will now try to do is they will try to shift their behavior kind of as little as possible while trying to get to the badge as quickly as possible, right? And we can write this down as kind of a simple Marco decision process if we want to think of it this way, where the user's utility, um, objective is to maximize uh, the utility of obtaining the badges while trying to deviate from their preferred behavior as little as possible. And this is a very simple computational model of behavior of humans under the presence of badges. And for example, the way, the way this model works, if you go and simulate it, you, basically badges act as, act as magnets. And, and what this is trying to show is what would be the user trajectories through this space as they approach the boundary of the badge. And what you notice as the user is approaching the badge, uh, the arrow points towards it, so it means the user steers in the action space towards moving towards that badge. And the other thing you notice is that that arrows are getting longer, which means the users are getting more engaged as they get closer to the badge. And after they cross it, they kind of go and try to catch the other one. So this is what the model computationally predicts. If we look at the data, we basically find exactly the same thing. So here's an example of one of such badges from Stack Overflow, where you know user gets it with 600 votes, and you see how the, the probability of voting increases as they are getting closer to the badge. After they cross the badge, the vertical line, um, the, the state gets reset, right? And now kind of that we have a computational model and, and we see that kind of it's able to, uh, to predict behavior in real systems, there is an X question, right? There is an engineering question. Can we design these incentive systems and deploy them in the real world? So actually here we worked with Andrew and Coursera and tried to incentivize um, students to study more in massive online courses. In particular, we worked with um, a class of 100,000 students taking machine learning and, and the goal was to increase forum engagement. So basically the idea was to increase the amount of reading and voting while not increase the amount of forum posting. So we created a set of badges for reading and voting, but we didn't give any badges for uh, uh, the amount of posting. And what was interesting is that actually it led to a, a big amount in increased engagement, but only along the targeted dimensions. So basically the amount of forum reading and voting increased uh, by quite a bit. So for example, people who did at least 100 actions, the number of those went up for a factor of five, while there was no difference in terms of posts and comments, which were the, exactly the dimensions that we didn't incentivize. So it seems that kind of we can in a targeted way incentivize people to do things. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And here's the second thing I wanted to mention that, that also kind of touches on this question of design and complex uh, feedback loops, right? We, are, we all know newspaper websites and we all go to them and we all kind of cannot restrain ourselves from reading the comments and whenever we read the comments, we are totally disappointed by the, by the humanity, right? <laughs> so the question is, wh what's going on in these systems, right? We have people write comments, people can upload comments, download comments, why are kind of, why is everything bad? And we actually sat on the, on the way and tried to understand what happens to users once they receive an evaluation, right? So the idea is that the user is writing posts and at some point in time, the user either receives a positive evaluation, lots of positive votes or lots of negative votes, a negative evaluation. The question is what happens to the user? And really to answer this question, we'd like to have a causal model, right? We'd like to know what, what is the effect of this evaluation. And what we would like to do is do a randomized trial, but that we cannot really do. But what we can do is kind of exploit the nature. The nature is doing randomized trials all the time for us. So in this case, we can find pairs of users that are practically indistinguishable, but by kind of by chance, one gets lots of positive votes and one gets lots of negative votes. And the question is, what happens to their subsequent activity? And just to kind of show the, it's a bit depressing, Posit users that get positive evaluations don't change, but users who get negative evaluations, they post worse quality content, they get more negative evaluations, kind of they get penalized by the community, they post even more, and they even vote more negatively on others, right? And this kind of downward spiral here, I'm showing you what happens on half a year of CNN.com, you see how the fraction of negative votes increased by, by 5%, which is, a huge, which is a huge increase. So the question is, what can we do with this, right? With, if we have this kind of user interaction mechanisms that lead to these downward spirals, what can we do? 
So what we set on doing was building machine learning models that would allow us to identify bad users or, or trolls. And we can do that quite well. We can do that with around 85% accuracy. The other thing we set on doing is changing the user interaction mechanism. So actually we changed now the interface of how people can interact uh, with each other on these forums with the hope that we can create better, healthier, and more enjoyable online communities um, and discussions. So this is what I wanted to say in my uh, 10 minutes and really just kind of to conclude and summarize. Basically, what I wanted to say is that there are two core computational ideas that play crucial, cru crucial roles in, in, in the development, I think, in, in the future computing applications. First one is, how do we design new systems in this space of billions of users interacting with each other? And the second question is, how do we model social processes that occur in these online computing applications? And of course, there are lots of hard scientific questions and fundamental societal problems or challenges in a sense of, you know, wh why do certain so uh, social processes produce the outcomes they do? How, how do our online worlds affect uh, these processes? There are as we are collecting massive data about user activity, there are both the looming privacy risks as well as the questions about what do we do when the software knows us better than what we do uh, than we do ourselves. And of course, you know, can all, can all these new tools that we are building, can they really help us understand ourselves uh, and each other uh, any better? Um, thank you very much. Um, so maybe if time for one or two questions. And uh, actually, Dan, do you want to say that while Yuri is? Any questions for Yuri? Hi. The, uh, the incentive system sounds a little bit top-down, command and control based. Um, do you have any insight into how that would fit in more, a more market-based system as opposed to one where a, a central authority is saying what's considered the right behavior for users to have? So, um, I mean, the way, the way why badges were nice in this case is because they are extremely cheap to give, right? So they don't cost anything. And basically, it's up to the designer of the system to decide what kind of incentives they want to, um, or what kinds of behaviors they want to promote. And it's very similar if you think to, you know, frequent flyer miles, uh, any kind of uh, reward points, and so on. The question is, what should even the incentive system be that would promote uh, good, good behavior? Now, um, that much. All right, thank you. Sorry. Um, and so our next speaker is Dan Bonet. Um, known Dan for a long time. He's uh, one of the people, so he works in computer security. He's one of the relatively few people I know that whenever he publishes a paper, um, people all around the world read it and code gets written all around the world whenever he discovers security flaw that, that, that often shortly makes it into all of our computers, just maybe weeks, maybe months later. Uh, so I'm excited. Dan will be telling us a bit more about computer security. Dan. Great. Thanks, Andrew. All right. So like Alex said, this is a fantastic time to be working in computer science. It's also a fantastic time to be working on computer security. The nice thing about computer security is it's a problem that's going to be with us for many years to come. It's only going to get worse with time. And I guarantee you that in 10 years, we'll still be working on computer security. In 100 years, we'll still be working on computer security. And probably even in 1,000 years, if we're not replaced by robots by then, we'll also be working on computer security. The reason this is happening is because really the only secure system is a system that's turned off. Right? Fundamentally, it's extremely difficult to build a system that can't be broken. And this, this kind of cat and mouse game between attackers and defenses is going to go on for a long time. So it's a fan because of this, it's a fantastic area of research, also known as job security. So <laughs> I would definitely encourage you to learn, to learn more about computer security, especially if you're looking to move inside of computer science. We cannot, there is an extreme need in industry for more expertise in computer security. We cannot graduate students fast enough with uh, knowledge in this area. So what I wanted to do in the few minutes that I have here is I wanted to tell you a little bit about some uh, recent work that we've done, and I want to conclude actually with a discussion of current policy issues around surrounding computer security, which is something that I think all of you need to be aware of that's currently happening uh, and uh, needs more uh, boots on the ground. So I hope I'll get to the, to the uh, policy side of things. What I'd like to tell you about on the technical side is um, recent work we've done on uh, mobile devices and particularly uh, uh, sensors, the implications of sensors on mobile devices. 
So as you know, if you look at your smartphone, there is a, a, a remarkable number of sensors on your smartphone, right? There's a microphone, a camera, a GPS, a light sensor, a compass, and so on and so forth. There are many, many, many sensors on these phones. Some of these sensors can actually be accessed without any user permission. For example, um, on Android, the gyroscope and the accelerometer they're not considered sensitive devices. The accelerometer is mostly used for playing games. You know, as you drive around in your car racing game, the accelerometer tells the program, tells the, at the game how you're holding your phone. Similarly, the power meter is something that's used for applications to monitor their own power usage. There doesn't seem like um, any, any, there's no uh, security permissions required to access these, these sensors. And in fact, all these sensors have kind of uh, specific functions that they're designed for. And the question that we wanted to ask is, can these sensor be, sensors be abused? Can they have unintended consequences? Now, when a security guy asks you if something can be abused, the answer is always yes. <laughs> yes? And that's actually what I want to show you uh, very briefly in the next two slides. The first, the first example of abuse is what I call uh, identifying mobile devices. So this actually dates back, the first work in this area dates back to 2006, this work by Lucas and Goljan, that shows uh, remarkably that when you, that if you, you, you can actually exploit imperfections in your camera sensors to link uh, images that were taken by the same camera. So if I post one camera with my name associated with, sorry, if I post one image taken from my phone with my name associated to it, to it. and then I, I post another image taken by my phone anonymously, just because of imperfections in the sensor, it's possible to link the two together and tell that the anonymous image was actually taken by me. So, so keep this in mind, every time you post an anonymous, anonymous image uh, taken by your phone, it's not as anonymous as you think. That's one thing to keep in mind. What we showed is we can actually use imperfections in the accelerometer to actually deduce a device, a stable device ID. So again, there is a model of how uh, manufacturing defects and just imperfections in how the accelerometer works. We're not interested in the results of the accelerometer readings. We're interested in how inaccurate the accelerometer readings are. So we know that if I put the accelerometer on the table, it should show me a force of 1G working downwards, but in fact it doesn't. There are errors in the measurements, and those errors turn out to be unique to your device. So an application can measure those errors and build a stable device ID. So even if you install an app, uh, it sends its device ID to the cloud, you then remove it and reinstall it, the app can tell that it's actually your, your phone that it was uh, reinstalled on. So you get a very stable device ID like this. And there's no way to get rid of it. You can reset your device. There's no way to get rid of, the, of this device ID. That was the first application. The more interesting ones um, were uh, the when we looked at the gyroscope, again, it's used to measure vibrations, and that's used for, uh, for games. What we realized, actually, and this is joint work with my, uh, with my student, Jan uh, Mikulovsky, who deserves a lot of the credit here, what, what we realized is that, in fact, gyroscopes are so sensitive, they can actually pick up air vibrations. Air vibrations is also known as speech. And in fact, uh, uh, these gyroscopes, which can be read by anyone, can actually pick up um, some form of speech. They can only be sampled at 200 hertz. So you get very, very low sampling, very, very low frequency frequencies. Not enough for the human ear to understand speech, but with machine learning, you can actually train an algorithm to recognize words. Yes, so anyone can use a gyroscope to recognize words, again, using machine learning. The third example I want to give you is the power meter. So a power meter was added to, device, to these devices just to measure how much power is being drained off of the battery. Now, what could possibly go wrong just by looking at how much power is drained off of the battery? Well, it turns out that when you drive around in your car, the amount of power that your phone uses to connect to the closest base station depends on obstacles along the way, right? So you, here it connects to your base station. If there's a tree, the amount of power it needs to, the radio consumes goes up. And in fact, as you drive around, you can see there's a very stable sort of graph of power consumption that comes up as, again, as you drive around around the city. So you should ask me, well, so what? So what can we do with this? Well, it turns out by driving around, you can build a power map of different, different roads around the country. And again, by using machine learning, you can then basically turn the power meter into a GPS. Yes, as you drive around a particular road in the city, we can match your power measurements, your current power measurements, to previously, previously measured power measurements in that road, and we can tell exactly where you are. Yeah, so in fact, I have a video here. You know, I don't need to play the video. Basically, we can tell where you are, yes? So this, 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 this video shows that we can track exactly how you're moving along this road, yeah? 
So I want to make sure that one thing gets across here that uh, you notice in these two applications, I said you know, sensors plus machine reading, plus machine learning. Machine learning, even in computer security, has become an indispensable tool. If there's one area of computer science where you need to educate yourself on, it's machine learning. Yeah, so please take Andrew's class. It's a remarkable tool that's used, as you see, everywhere across all of computer science, including in our lab. Okay. So that's the, uh, so yeah, so what do we do? Well, there are basically ways to defend against this. Essentially, the mistake, the, we only, always need to alert the user, the user that sensors are being accessed, and generally applications should not be given direct access to sensors. This seems to be quite a dangerous thing to do, and we should avoid that as much as we can. So that kind of, that's the technical part of, the, of my presentation. I have a minute or two? Uh, awesome, two minutes, awesome. Uh, I wanted to talk, switch gears now, and talk a little bit about policy in that, again, these are things that you should all be aware of that they're happening right now. So these are things that we call, in the policy world, we call them uh, crypto wars. So crypto wars have actually been going on for a long time. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but when crypto, crypto was actually, modern crypto was actually invented here at Stanford by, by Diffie, Merkel, and Hellman. Hellman was a professor at WE at the time. Uh, this was done in 1975, 1976. And there was an attempt when they tried to publish their papers, there was an attempt to classify all open crypto research. So the crypto would not be allowed to be done in the open community. Fortunately, you know, we do live in a country that has the First Amendment and, you know, research is protected under speech, so that didn't go, didn't go too far. So that was good. The second crypto war happened in the mid-90s where, I don't know if you guys remember, um, there was this fear that all phone conversations would become encrypted Law enforcement tried to get, or even Congress, tried to get um, uh, uh, AT&T and other phone companies to adopt something called key escrow, implemented using this thing called the Clipper chip, which would give, which would basically a, ch a chip that would be embedded in every single phone in the world, yes? And that, that chip would encrypt the phone conversation under the legitimate user's key and also under what's called the law enforcement uh, agency key. That actually resulted in quite a bit of outcry, and that was also uh, rejected, primarily for the reasons that uh, bad guys could easily circumvent it using what's called double encryption. I just encrypt on top of the AT&T encryption layer, and now key escrow goes away. Also, there was fears of abuse. What I want you to be aware is that right now we're living through what we call the third crypto wars. So this is happening right now the third crypto wars, where again, there's an attempt to add back doors to every single encryption product on the planet. Um, the consequences of this, I think, would be quite disastrous to the US software industry. If, if um, uh, basically, if there was a requirement that US companies would have to backdoor their encryption products, that would basically mean that foreign companies are likely not to well, they're going to have trouble buying uh, products develop, developed in the U.S. So this is going to have pretty significant co uh, consequences to the U.S. Uh, software industry. There's also the question of who has the back door, right? If the U.S. can ask for a back door, there's nothing preventing other countries from asking for back doors as well, and that's a pretty slippery slope to go down. How is this going to play out? We don't know. It's really up to all of us to figure out how this is going to play out. So I wanted you to be aware this is happening right now, and since I'm supposed to make predictions about the future, you can kind of see a pattern here. Yes? Does anybody recognize an arithmetic sequence when you see one? <laughs> so my prediction is that the next crypto war is going to be in 2035, and really it's going to be up to our kids to decide how, this crypt how that crypto war will turn out. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. A couple of questions for Dan. Everybody's depressed. Yes. Yes, please, Vince. And we have a few mics around at the uh, edges of rumors of Google. Vince. So it's Vince Cerf again, Google. Um, I think I have a prediction on how this current crypto war is going to come out. I don't think that the, uh, the guys who want to decrypt everything for uh, law enforcement purposes are going to win this round either for uh, a bunch of obvious reasons. The same ones that triumphed in Crypto Wars 1 and 2. So that would be my prediction, and that's a testable theory. Thank you, Vin. I hope you're right. But, however, we shouldn't take it as a given, and it's really up to all of us to make sure this is what happens. Uh, yeah, do, do you have pass a... Oh, well, all right, move. All right, let's, let's move. Fei Fei, actually... Uh, oh, wait, one more question. Dan, just uh, uh, one more. Good, go for it. Oh, it's for him. Yes. Uh, what's the rationale to ask for 
back doors if you can always, if you're really a bad guy, you can always double encrypt. I think that's actually a really, really good question. I think the, the okay, so now you're asking me to play devil's advocate. Um, so the, the question is basically, if we can double encrypt, what is the point of having a backdoor? Because you're, you're only going to have a backdoor to the lower level of encryption, not the higher level of encryption. The, you know, I agree. What's the point of having a backdoor in that case? So that standard argument that you hear is that uh, you will catch the dumb criminals, right? And so that's better than not catching anyone. So there is, there is an argument. You know, it's, it's up to us to decide whether that's a good enough argument to destroy the software industry. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Um, our next speaker is uh, Fei Fei Li, um, who is one of the persons who, perhaps more than anyone else, has helped define the field of computer vision in the last decade. Um, computer vision is one of the areas that's been taking off like crazy. Computers can see so much better than they could a decade ago, and I think Fei Fei. Uh, more than anyone else has defined the problems and the benchmarks as well as many of the solutions that drove not just her group forward but the entire field forward. Um, she's also currently the director of the Stanford AI Lab and, and she's here to tell us about visions. Fei Fei. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everyone. It's quite an honor to be here. Um, so I'll share with you a both of journey of our, uh, of our field as well as myself in the quest for visual intelli intelligence. So Alex already introduced you to this man. His name is Alan Turing. More than uh, 60 years ago, Turing dared humanity with a very important question. Can we make machines that can think as well as humans to the point that if we hide them behind the walls and ask a human to interact with either a machine or another human, we cannot tell the difference. And that is the beginning of modern artificial intelligence. And that planted seed, that very Turing test, planted seed to one of the most exciting field of computer science. Fast forward 60 years after Turing, our world has fundamentally changed. You've already heard a lot from uh, both Yuri and Dan. So we have more sensors than humans in the, on the planet. We're making cars that are about to drive themselves. We have all kinds of imaging techniques that take imageries inside of human bodies, outer space, into the, into the, the wild, unexplored uh, front, frontiers. We are really generating massive amount of data, both in imagery and other forms. So this really exciting opportunity also created challenges. Unifying all these uh, three examples and more is one challenge that has been a major question in my field, as well as facing today's industry and the, the rest of the world, is how do we make sense of what we're seeing? We're generating, in the past 30 days, humanity has generated more photos than the entire civilization combined. YouTube sees 120 hours of videos per minute. There's no way we will be able to understand the data we generate. Or, at the flip side, as much as we've been making lots of progress, for our self-driving cars, we're still having trouble to make sense of what we see as possibly a crumble paper bag versus a rock that should be avoided. Or for our doctors, as we have all kind of imaging machines, ultrasound, x-ray, MRI, PET scan, but yet humans are behind the readings of all these imageries. So fundamentally, we haven't fully answered Turing's challenge. And this is the theme of my research. I believe if we want to make machines to think, think well, think beyond they've ever been uh, doing, we need to teach them to see. So what does it mean to teach machines to see? Here's a picture. A picture is taken by a camera. And it does so by registering lights reflected from the surface of the world into numbers. But these are just lifeless numbers. 
They do not carry meaning in themselves. And to me, to see is to really understand, not just to register numbers. And in fact, this is a really hard task. It took nature about 540 million years to evolve our human visual system. And after that, more than 50% of the brain's real estate is used up for visual processing. So vision begins with the eyes, but truly takes place in the brain. So now our task in the field of computer vision and artificial intelligence is to really build a machine that can see. And what are the tasks involved? Back to this picture again. If I want to build a machine that can ultimately see everything humans do, it should be able to recognize objects, to identify people, to understand the relationships between things and stuff, and to be able to tell the story, just like you and I do. So where do we begin? Well, in the simplest terms, we want to teach machines to see by showing it examples, and then ask the machine to learn about what it sees and be able to figure out what it is. So um, here's a simple example of teaching a machine to see cat. We show machines several, um, several uh, uh, examples of a cat, and then it learns what a cat is. How hard can this be, right? This is a cat. It's made of several uh, geometric shapes. So this is exactly what it did. we did in the early days of modeling. We tell the algorithm, here are the shapes you need to learn for the cat. But what about this cat? <laughs> Now we have to add another different set of shapes and uh, a config configuration. Cats are kind of tricky animals. We also have these cats. So you get my point. If we keep telling the algorithm, these are the different things you need to model, the algorithm and the modelers behind it will just soon go crazy. So about eight years ago, some, an insight, very simple but profound insight, changed my own way of thinking. Children don't learn to see this way. Nobody tells a child how you should see. They do this, especially in the early years of development, by just experiencing the world and lots of examples. In fact, if you consider a child's pair of eyes, a pair of biological cameras, they take a picture about every 200 millisecond. So by age three, a child would have seen hundreds of millions of pictures. And that's a lot of data. So this is what we did. We launched the ImageNet project in an attempt to put together the biggest data set of images that we can give it to uh, computers and the computer algorithms to teach them to see. And this is an effort of global citizenship. Together, almost 50,000 online workers worldwide across 167 countries worked with us through the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform to label billions and billions of pictures. And after three years of effort, we have put together an ImageNet data set of 50 million images across 22,000 categories, uh, totally um, distributed for free to the research world. And this changed the way we think about machine learning and think about computer vision. So with this massive amount of data to nourish our computer, um, computer brain, a very critical opportunity arise. It turned out this amount of data is perfect for a classic algorithm that saw its new life in the age of big data, and that's called convolutional neural network. Without getting into the details, a convolutional neural network is consisted of neuron-like nodes that takes input from other nodes and send output to others. Moreover, hundreds and thousands and millions of these nodes are put together in hierarchical fashion, somewhat similar to the brain, to make computation 
um, more um, uh, to to make computation for more complex tasks. So this is a typical neural network model my students and I work with. It has 24 million nodes, 140 million parameters, and 50 billion connections. So together with the, uh, the data we have available, plus the modern new convolutional neural network architecture, we have made tremendous progress in object recognition. Here are some examples of our algorithm seeing cats in uh, pictures, but it doesn't just see cats, it also sees teddy bears and boy or dogs on the beach, a person, a small kite in the background, or even a bit very busy picture. Even when the algorithm is not so sure of what it's seeing, <laughs> we have taught it to be smart enough to give you a safe answer instead of committing too much. And sometimes it goes beyond the human ability. We have trained an algorithm to recognize 3,000 types of cars ever manufactured after 1990 by humanity and taken this algorithm to 50 million Google Street View images. We're able to make predictions of our cities and society that we've never done before. We confirm that car prices indeed correlate very well with household income, but we also predict crime rate based on car prices or presidential voting patterns based on car prices. So my time is almost up, but I have one cool thing to show you. So is that it? Object recognition has made tremendous progress in the past few, uh, few uh, years. But just like a child, that's just the first part of development. Soon, another very important developmental stage will hit, and children begin to speak in sentences. OK, that's a cat sitting in a bed. Those are people that are going on an airplane. That's a big airplane. This is a three-year-old describing her world beyond just a few nouns. So what we did in the next step is to continue build upon this neural network architecture, but take natural language sentences generated by humans as well, as well as pictures and show the computer algorithm what these two pairs look like and ask the algorithm to learn to associate visual snippets with words and phrases in sentences. Now I'm ready to show you what our result looked like. This is the newest re result that came out of Stanford Vision Lab about four or five months ago that shows for the first time that computer is uh, capable of telling a simple story when seeing pictures. A large airplane sitting on top of an airport runway. A man is standing next to an elephant. Of course, we still have a long way to go. Our computers still make mistakes. If it sees too many cats during training time, it thinks everything the is a cat. On a bed in a blanket. Or it doesn't... A young boy is holding a baseball bat. It <laughs> cannot tell the difference between, between baseball bat and toothbrush. Or... A man riding a horse down the street next to a building. I don't know. I think this is correct. <laughs> So um, let's just conclude with this, this parting picture again. We began with this picture. And so far, we've learned to recognize objects. We've a also learned sitting at a table with a cake. to tell a story of this picture. But there's so much more to this picture. This is a child seeing a very special Easter cake coming from Italy, wearing his favorite t-shirt bringing his toy to the, to the dinner table and showing this kind of happiness that you and I can all tell. This is actually my son, Leo. In my quest for visual intelligence, I think of Leo constantly. So for Turing, the challenge is, how do we build machines that can think? For me, and I hope it is for you as well, the challenge is, how do we use machines that can think that can see, that can speak, to build a better future for Leo, for other children, for visually impaired, for aging elders, for everyone, and for our environment. Thank you.
Um, thanks, Fei-Fei. Um, I think we're running late on time, but uh, let me ask, uh, uh, actually, while, while, while Balaji is setting up, does anyone have a question for Fei-Fei? Thanks. What is the real-time performance of your story creation algorithm? So the when the algorithm is already tr uh, is completely trained up, the speed is really fast. We're talking about less than a second, but the training takes longer time. All right. Thanks, Fei. So, how many of you ran into a traffic jam on your way here this morning? I did. So Balaji is working on solving that. Um, with technology. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody, to the CS department, uh, 50th anniversary. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you're going to hear about a big data system for getting rid of traffic congestion. Uh, you'll see that congestion on the road is the same as congestion in your nose. Uh, common cold is a well-known problem. You can mitigate it. We can control it. Uh, is just as hard to deal with as road congestion. That's what I'm learning, okay? Uh, but uh, I'm a computer networks guy by background, so how did I get into transportation and uh, 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 big data systems for transportation? There's nothing like uh, getting stuck in a traffic jam like this in Bangalore to put you, uh, you know, out of frust first you get frustrated, then you get curious as to how to solve this problem. And so one of these cars is me, some, somewhere in there. Okay, but this isn't about a city growing really fast and uh, traffic being uh, just bursting at the seams. Um, it's also true in a different mode of transport, for example, buses in China, uh, or also uh, as a well-known thing about trains in Japan. Right. And so no matter what mode of uh, transport we look at, it, it, it's just if it, congestion isn't in, in your part of the world, it's getting there. Okay. And uh, this is sort of the mother of all traffic jams. Uh, it's a, a 60 mile or 100 kilometer long traffic jam uh, out of Beijing into Indian Mongolia. And so it's sort of very, very large in space. Um, and do you know how long it lasted? Anybody has, knows? Nine, nine days. Okay. So it's not some small space time phenomenon. This is a massive. Uh, you know, you can see the sort of thing from space, right? Um, so it's not just commuter frustration and indignity, okay? This is, we all suffer uh, these uh, problems every day. Uh, there's a real cost to this. Uh, the Texas Transportation Institute assesses the cost of congestion as the extra fuel and extra time we spend by, while being stuck in traffic. So it's not the cost of transportation, which is the fuel and time you spend to, let's say, drive at 60 miles per hour. It's when you're slower than that, due to congestion, what is the cost? And this is a pretty huge number. Uh, one can expect that 10 to 20% of this number can be uh, dinged down through our efforts. And uh, that is just the cost measured in, in time and fuel. But uh, emissions is extra, uh, as is safety. Uh, road accidents are uh, on the rise worldwide. But more importantly as well, even in the subway systems when the platform is open, uh, you have these people coming in, and the only way they can leave is through the trains. And so if you don't stop people from getting into the platform, you've got this you know, bad situation developing. Okay? So the, uh, um, the problem of congestion is one that's hitting the world uh, every day, essentially. Right? So you can describe the basic problem as one where demand is in excess of supply by quite a bit. Uh, the economist's solution to this problem is raise price. Okay? Congestion charging, uh, <clears throat> very unpopular. Uh, New York City, uh, Bloomberg famously tried to institute congestion charging or even put it to the vote and he couldn't do that. Uh, we have been working on incentives. So pay the people who make off-peak trips uh, rather than only uh, charge the people who make peak trips or just forget about charging people who make peak trips. We've run three successful projects, one in Bangalore uh, with employees of Infosys. And here in, the, in Stanford University, a DOT-funded project for our commuters uh, over a two and a half year period. 
And the biggest one is uh, in Singapore, it's, it's now more than three, year, three years and three months and it's going on, it's for their public transit users to encourage them to take off-peak trips. Okay? It's like an airline frequent flyer program. Uh, I've talk, talked about that before, so I'm just going to get into the other side, which is uh, how do we uh, increase the amount of supply. So if you look at these networks, I'm going to show you uh, there is enough capacity. Um, you know, we've sort of learned how to take out every uh, um, uh, ounce of bandwidth from computer networks that we can, uh, or you know, operate data centers at high e efficiency. But transportation networks have not reached anywhere near that level of efficiency yet. Okay? And so with big data and mobile apps, uh, we've been trying to get uh, the extra supply that's available, uh, made, uh, sorry, that's, that's, that's present, be made available to the demand. Okay? So let's look at supply of transport capacity, and let's say that our goal is to really, really, really get into congestion. Understand it uh, in excruciating detail, like weather, okay? <clears throat> and this is useful because if you can measure it, you can improve it, okay? And so if you look at all the things that move in a city, so you want to look for things that emit electronic signatures, right? And so cars, city buses, metro systems, uh, smartphones, food, all of these things move. There are many other things that move, but these things in particular carry labels on them that are uh, emi you know, emitting signatures as they move. Right? Now it looks like there's a lot of data to play with. Okay? So we should be able to get our hands around all of the traffic problems and other, among other things. Right? But the problem with data in this sort of world is it's piecemeal. So you see a person tapping into a train station and then tapping out, you don't know how they went. Okay? Uh, you don't have uh, sensors on the platform. You don't have uh, other extra sensors, right? And uh, to know how many people there are in a particular train, now trains are being built where the floors are weighing scales, okay? So you go on, a total weight is taken uh, every you know, instant, and then a per capita you know, uh, uh, average weight is, uh, you know, is divided into that, and you get an average count. And so people are trying to do lots of these things, uh, and analog data is error-prone and noisy, needs a lot of healing and curing, and it's siloed. This is sort of, the bus guys are very different from the guys who are on trains. And people get off buses and get into trains, but there's no real glue that binds how that process works. Okay? So what we need is a system and algorithms for solving a big, massive uh, puzzle. Okay? You just have to put things together. Okay? So I'm going to just uh, say that there's this thing we've been building called the space-time engine, which takes in data, correlates it, uh, or uses auxiliary other data like weather, points of interest, events, uh, like Stadia emptying themselves out, and will produce the kind of system I'm about to show you very briefly. Okay? And we've been working with not just public transit folks, but also uh, connected cars and uh, taxi folks, smart taxis. Uh, everybody's into big data these days. Uh, that's, I think, a phenomenon that's actually hit, and I think Andrew was mentioning, or Dan was mentioning it. Uh, if you haven't got a big data system in your house, go to Fry's and buy one. Uh, it's, it's useful to have it, okay? And so smart logistics, um, tracking packages, et cetera, and mobile apps, okay? Um, so I'm going to give you a demo, but before I do that, let me situate this. What data we have is the tap in, tap out data from a metro system. That's one of the two demos. The second demo is a New York City taxi. Uh, open, uh, they, they've released the taxi data, and I'm going to show you a demo of that, too. So I know in this uh, subway system, this, this map is of Singapore, uh, where someone got in and where they got out. Okay? And I know this for everybody. Okay? And of course, the, the card numbers are all anonymized. The thing is, I don't know what route they took. So if I know you got in here, let's say, and you got out there, I don't know if you went this way or you went this way. Algorithmically, we can find out. Okay? And I don't know where the trains are. Okay, you don't sort of have this issue of, you don't get in the platform and start walking, so you need to be boarding trains. And often, in the peak hour, you cannot board the first train that comes to the platform. You get into the platform and you queue up, and then the trains are running full, so you, you know, you take, it takes you three or four trains worth of missing uh, a queuing to get into the train. Okay? So these are things that all these agencies want to know. How crowded are the platforms? How long people are waiting? These are performance measures, right? Okay, so with that, let me get into the demo. And the algorithms are fun, but I'm not going to, in the interest of time, be able to tell you about them. 
happy to, and also the demos are going to be brief. So this is a demo system called Fredonia. It resembles a large public transit system. Whoops. I'm going to have trouble because I need to use the mouse. Uh, let me just give me a second. Yep, yep. So, great, thanks. So, <coughs> the, what I'm going to show you is what we call a digital replica of this system. So, at 8 in the morning on a particular day, let's say 15th of January 2014, some number of riders, some number of cards showed up in the system, made some number of trips. And what you see here is a reconstruction of the exact location of all the trains and their occupancies. Uh, each of these rectangles is a train. The amount of grain is the number of people in that train at that instant. And these blinking lights are alerts. These, uh, these green lines here are queues of people waiting on the platform to board the trains. When these queues get long, these alerts are raised. So it's a morning peak hour sort of issue. So I can click on any of these things that's moving, and I can find out the occupancy of that train at different stations. Right? And here are uh, other details you can get on this, at the station Orion. You can find out uh, performance measures that we care about, like um, sorry, like platform waiting time and occupancies. I think I've lost. Let me play it on. Sorry, I think I've lost this particular demo. But the alerts are raised, and you can find out everything you need to know numerically about the uh, performance measures of the system. The important thing I want to point out to you is notice all the outbound trains, this one, this direction, this direction, and every outbound direction away, away from the central downtown area. They're almost always uncrowded. Okay? That is where you have transport capacity. So how do you reclaim this? right? So one of the most important things to realize with these public transit systems is that you have the option of flipping these trains around before they reach the end. So if I let this train uh, turn around here and go back, it can be closer to the demand and where it's needed. So I do this one in four or five trains, and I've got extra capacity. And each of these trains is about $20 million. So you don't really need sometimes lots of capacity. You're actually only using half the capacity that's available. Right? So that's an example of how data can help you uh, as well as help you understand uh, for in a, in a uh, uh, counterfactual sense. Okay? So that's uh, trains in uh, Fredonia. Here's New York City taxis. So here's the system as you can uh, view it. And the number of taxis on a Sunday morning, uh, Sunday morning is down here, as are the number of uh, uh, passengers in these taxis. And uh, yellow taxis are empty and blue taxis are hired. If I want to know uh, where are the taxis that have at least uh, one or two people, and only one or two people in them, I can turn on that filter. Right? And if I want to know where the trip fares, where are the taxis that are having trip fares that are at least uh, $25, where are they going? Where are the origins, what are the origins destinations of these sort of high trip fare uh, rides? Uh, and in New York City, you, if you do this, you'll find out that most of them are going to the JFK airport or Newark airport. Okay? And like this, you can sort of go ahead and start mining this and plumbing this. And we have some answers to questions like that you may always have been curious about. Who tips more, New Yorkers or visitors? Okay. Do New Yorkers under tip the taxi drivers? We can answer that question. Um, what happens do, when fans go to a Knicks game? Do they pay more tips as they go to the game or come away from the game? And how does the effect of the result in the game affect their, their interest in tipping? Okay. So I can tell you the answers to those questions, but this is sort of system that lets you get there. Okay? Thanks very much. Thanks, Willa. 
Thanks, Balaji. Um, we're, we're running a little bit behind uh, on, on time as usual, but let me just take one quick question. And I don't want to say that one. All right. Um, so you just heard Balaji talk about um, using technology to help influence huge groups of people. Um, Michael Bernstein works on crowdsourcing, which is a different way of using technology, um, not just to influence people, but to help them come in to have tens of thousands of people do work uh, uh, as a team. And he's been developing systems to let them do not just simple tasks, but do more and more complex tasks. So let, let Michael tell you a bit about that. Good morning. So for years, we've largely thought as, of computation as a tool that helps us get our work done. So the world gives us some task and we turn to the computer, and the computer helps us get it done. We turn to our spreadsheets, we turn, uh, you know, it's programmable. This is fantastic, because that means we can design that relationship. When we can design the relationship, we can improve it. We can help making the doing of this work as fluent and as powerful as possible. But what's happening now is that computation is becoming not just the tool that we use to get our work done, it's shifting to becoming the entire infrastructure that connects us to the work. The work is no longer coming from the world. It's not coming from my manager around the corner. It's coming from other people on the network. Look at services like Uber, which connect riders with drivers. Look at platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk, which helped Fei Fei, uh, just as she described, build this ImageNet platform that she described to you. And this has connected us, or the crowds, together to get things done. But largely what it's allowed us to do is just talk to each other, right? We can get into effectively the equivalent of a gigantic uh, water cooler and talk. And this is incredibly powerful. We've been able to create things like Wikipedia just through this kind of communication and interaction. But it also has meant that we're left to more or less organize, organize according to our own devices. And if there's anything that uh, about 50 years of organizational behavior research has taught us, it's that we're not very good at this. So just as in psychology we know all of these cognitive biases and heuristics that we use that fall short, we are not very good, as Yuri's indicated, at having good intuitions about how large-scale or emergent behaviors might happen. So what I've been wondering, I see an opportunity here. Just like we could design the interaction between an individual and their work through computing, we can also design the entire infrastructure that's, con that's connecting us to our work because it's now computational. So imagine that computing could actually help us guide our efforts and our organizations. And what I wonder, could it help us overcome some of these errors in organizing and help us actually accomplish far more difficult and complex tasks than we've ever been able to do as a species before? That is my goal, and that is what I see as a vision for what computation can do in the next 50 years. Now, if you've looked around so far, what you've seen is something that's effectively called crowdsourcing as a term for this, where we take big, big, big tasks and we split it up into lots of tiny, tiny, tiny pieces and give it to lots of people. And this has been incredibly powerful just to give you a sense. You know, my own group has been able to uh, connect it with data mining. So, for example, to, to mine huge data sets of code to identify patterns in how people program and then use the humans to actually augment it. So now your IDE can actually tell you what, it, what this magic pattern is that you've been using or to make ourselves smarter. So I'm about to show you two videos. Try to figure out in which, in which one this uh, YouTube user is lying. All right, here's the first one. I broke my hand beating someone up because I punched him so many times in the face. This is gonna be tough. <laughs> I've stolen things from a store. All right, think about it for a sec. If you think the first video was him lying, raise your hand. If you think the second video, about half and half. That's actually about uh, what we saw. Uh, so, turns out, first one's the truth, and what we can do is actually go out to the web and get people to nominate features, not actually try to make the predictions, but to say, what is it that might, might allow me to, to differentiate these things? People are great at, at coming up with these differentiating features, but they're very bad at weighing evidence. Turns out machine learning is actually quite good at weighing evidence. So what we're able to do is build systems that can, for example, note that this person used a very short sentences and few details, which indicates that they were likely lying. And do something that's, even on a lie detection task, 10% more accurate than us out here in the audience would be, or 300% relative. 
Now this is all with microtask crowdsourcing very powerful, but it leaves us really falling short. What we really want to be accomplishing is in some sense as humanity is things that are very complex, design, engineering, writing, and you can't really connect, de decompose these as easily into these completely isolated tasks as all of you who write software know. There's a lot of interdependency going on. But I wonder, I ask, could we in fact crowdsource these kinds of things? Could we crowdsource the entire user-centered design process? If you gave me a napkin sketch today, could I give you back a user-tested working piece of software tomorrow? And the way we want to do this is by stopping the thinking of the internet as a bunch of sort of amateurs. What if we start to think of them as people who have expertise and backgrounds and interests? And we can even think of this in some sense as the future of paid work and organizations. Uh, there are already platforms such as Elance and Odesk and Topcoder and, and many others where you can find designers, singing, singers, whatever you're looking for, programmers, on demand at scale. Think of this as the crowd relative to the cloud, elastic and available. So what we've been thinking about is things that we call flash teams, which are computational uh, approaches to bringing together groups of, pe of experts who have never before met, may never meet again, and scaffolding them to complete really complex tasks, such as that napkin sketch uh, uh, example I just gave you. And under the, under the hood, it looks very simple. It's effectively a very structured uh, uh, workflow where you just want to connect things like low fidelity mockups to high fidelity prototypes through the kinds of skills you need and structured inputs and outputs. What's really an interesting about this is that for the first time, computation actually has visibility into the work that people are trying to accomplish. And because it does, it can start to enact on it. For example, these teams can become modular. So we can, I can create one, sure. I can easily create three of them just by instantiating additional ones out of the crowd. So given different inputs, we can take different napkin sketches and produce different prototypes out of it. Because they're modular, we can also compose them like we would software. So we can take multiple teams and create sort of Lego-style macro-scale organizations. We're very familiar with elastic growth here. We can parameterize these teams so that by default, we don't need three programmers, mythical man month understood. We only need one by default, but if we have needs based on someone who actually uh, has a particular skill, for example, the team can grow and shrink on demand. We can also think about uh, traditional techni techniques like pipelining. If all I need to tell the system is that certain types of, uh, of tasks, like a, say a low fidelity mockup, a sketch that I'm producing, producing I, can, I can stream that out. I can give you a screen at a time. What we can start to do is automatically optimize these teams so that people aren't waiting for each other or, or sort of busy waiting. We can even create these things by request. So let's say I have a, you have your napkin sketch, but yeah, you don't, want, you don't want a working prototype. What you want is actually an animation describing the idea. And we may not actually have ever seen this team before, but we may have pieces of many previous other teams through these structured inputs and outputs that we can actually pull together and create synthetically a team that has never, ever before existed. And it turns out we can call back to some research that came out of this department many years ago uh, with action planning languages like strips to effectively solve these things very efficiently at the scale at which we're talking. So this is in some sense a future of work that's computationally enabled. So we also need to understand what is the future of the workplace. We've, started, we've been working on systems that we call things like Foundry where we allow people to author these teams or track the progress. So for example, you might be able to create these kinds of workflows I was just describing to you, then turn it around and become a sort of computational manager where it keeps track of what's on time, what's running behind, and keeps everyone up to date. And just to give you a sense, we are in fact able to go through this entire process of a low fidelity mockup, heuristic evaluation, revised mockup, software prototype, user test, and revised software prototype, all in about 24 hours and for about $1,000 of expert work on Odesk. Now these aren't perfect, but they are prototypes. We can also think about other kinds of creative and complex work. Could we create flash teams that, that can uh, create animations? So many of you may know my colleague, Terry Winograd, who recently uh, retired. We wanted to actually celebrate his retirement through the creation, uh, through, through using a Flash team to tell a story uh, that, he, that he uses when he built a computer in his garage. You'll recognize Terry because he looks like um, Einstein. This was created in about two days, 48 hours, through people who had never met before. Good morning, son. Oh, hey, Dad. What the? What is that? 
It's the future! It works! <laughs> hmm. <laughs> that it works was basically me in the background of the labs being excited. So not to be outdone by, by Daphne I, and, and Andrew, I was wondering, could we actually create these macro scale organizations? Could I create a useless MOOC? That is, could we combine many of these modular teams to create something for sort of ad hoc skills? So we, we use these design teams to create platforms, these animation teams to create videos, and a, a new sort of education team where we combined uh, topic experts with people who have training in curricular design uh, to create this essentially entire organization that in about a day was able to create little uh, micro lessons on the order of a couple minutes to teach you how to sing from the diaphragm, take portrait photography, and so on. So this is the kind of future that I see coming forward. We have been thinking about if we're creating a future of, of labor, do we also need to understand what the future of labor organization will be? We've been working on platforms that allow these groups to, for example, organize, in this case, uh, to, to create a letter writing campaign uh, to Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. These are workers on Amazon's Mechanical Turk platform that got covered in uh, The Guardian and many others. They are trying to take control of the media narrative and actually affect change that they want in their workplace. But I think thinking forward, we might ask, you know, what should we be creating, as Dan indicated, for our children if they, were go if they are going to work, grow up into this workforce? And I think if I can ask you to help me solve any sorts of problems, it's going to be things like this. Reputation is, is fundamentally broken in these systems. Anytime that someone is advertising their qualities using all caps and stars, I get a little worried. And, but this is the, the state of the art. We need to understand how to design these kinds of um, reputation and systems. I think connecting with education, MOOCs have had an incredible effect out on society. But I wonder, do we need to stop there? Could work become a part of our education? Could work study become something that we draw on from these crowd marketplaces to help us enhance our skills or micro internships? Could these become possible? And the future of organizations themselves, could a crowd have created the iPhone? I think not, at least not right now. But could it have? And what would it take to get there? I'll close here. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Michael. Um, any questions? There's... Then to game. On that last point with the uh, crowdsourced uh, mobile phone, there is a project at Google called ARA, A-R-A. It's uh, essentially a modular phone. You get to build pieces of the phone and they fit together. Uh, that might be the platform on which to experiment with what you're suggesting. That's a great, it's a great point. So I think the, the trick is that from, for the last five to 10 years, what we've gotten very good at is taking big sort of embarrassingly parallel, if you will, human tasks and, and cleverly decomposing them. And I think moving forward, what we need to address is what's known as coordination neglect, the ability uh, to reintegrate all of that. How do we as humans best integrate our activities? And is it through these completely uh, separated and modular components? Or what is, I think what's especially going to be interesting is what is that interface going to look like? And how do we design that? Great, thank you. So um, theory is the foundation of all of computer science. And so we wanted to wrap up the session by having a Tim Ruffgarden tell us a little bit about um, the latest uh, uh, landscape and what's happening in CS theory. Um, so Tim. OK, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so one amazing thing about computer science is that in addition to transforming the world around us, as you've been hearing about from all my colleagues earlier this morning, it's also a field with tremendous mathematical and intellectual depth. And I think this depth is especially apparent in theoretical computer science. That's the field which studies Fundamentally, what are the power and limits of computation? So what can computers do? What can they not do? And it has a very rich history. So as Alex mentioned uh, this morning, Alan Turing, back in 1936, uh, he proposed a mathematical model for computation. This is before we really even had computers. And yet already in 36, Turing was proving there are things that co computers could not do. For example, the unsolvability of the halting problem. At Stanford, too, there's a very rich history in theoretical CS. For example, the Lifetime Achievement Award in Theory CS, it's called the Knuth Prize, named, of course, after Don Knuth. 
Uh, right now, it's actually also a very exciting time to be in theory at Stanford. The department's just made a big investment in theory, hired roughly one new person a year for each of the past five years or so. So that's transformed the group into what used to be, you know, strong but fairly small into what's unquestionably one of the best theory groups uh, in the world. So whenever you do theoretical CS for a living and you're asked to give a talk that involves some kind of prediction, you feel sort of obliged to at least say something about the P versus NP problem. <laughs> So let me dispense with that and then move on to other topics. <laughs> so what's the problem? The problem is really, you know, if I only tell you that, a, that you can efficiently verify a solution to a problem, is that actually good enough to more powerfully compute a solution to that problem from scratch? So the problems in P, these are the problems you learn about in your undergraduate algorithms class, shortest paths, matrix multiplication, et cetera, stuff we have efficient algorithms for. There's a much longer list of so-called NP problems, which most people don't believe can be solved efficiently, but at least you can say the following. If somebody handed you a solution to an NP problem on a silver platter, you could at least verify it as such easily. So the traveling salesman problem, for example, if somebody somehow came up with a way to fly between 20 different cities, which only took you know, $2,000 of, of, uh, of, of flight fares, you could verify that very easily. So P versus NP asks, is efficient verification sufficient to actually compute a solution from scratch? So the notoriety of this question is transcending computer science. So in 2000, the Clay Mathematics Institute published a list of seven math problems meant to be grand challenges for the 21st century. So it's only seven problems. So we're talking like, you know, Poincaré conjecture, Riemann hypothesis, Navier-Stokes equations. P versus NP was one of those seven problems. So it's quite elite company. Uh, so back in 2000, the, the prize amounts of one million per question seemed pretty reasonable. In 2015, I actually feel like that sounds kind of quaint. So maybe... <laughs> Maybe there's someone in the room that can help the Clay Mathematics Institute sort of boost their prize levels to a more respectable amount. <laughs> so predictions, uh, is this falling in the next 10 years? I'd be very surprised. This is one of those things where with each passing day, we actually feel further from a solution, not closer. Will we see any partial progress? You know, I don't know, but if we see any, I think it's as likely to be at Stanford as anywhere else. So what would partial progress mean? So fundamentally, if you believe P not equal to NP, that's asserting that a certain class of algorithms cannot solve a certain class of problems. So you can get an easier to prove statement by making the class of algorithms only smaller, only weaker, or making the class of problems only bigger, only more difficult. That gives you easier versions of the problem to try to prove. And so the world re record for a problem of this type is held by Ryan Williams, which is one of the uh, recent hires that I mentioned to you. So he proved that you know, ACC zero algorithms, whatever those are, can't solve all problems in non-deterministic exponential time. So the point being is there is progress being made. Maybe we'll see it in 10 years, maybe not, but we might well see it at Stanford. Okay, so if we don't see progress there, where do I predict we will see progress in the next 10 years? Well, a really fun thing about being in theory is in addition to having these deep problems that span many decades, there's constantly motivation for new theory coming from the emerging applications and technologies that we inevitably have in computer science. And we're certainly going to see some new stuff over the next 10 years uh, to address these new applications. I'm just going to very briefly mention two sort of totally different examples, which I and some other colleagues have been thinking about, to give you the spirit for the kinds of things that I mean. So back in the 60s and 70s, when the classical theory of algorithms was being developed, People had in mind, you know, you have sort of one computer, you have one algorithm running on that computer, like you have an array, and the algorithm's just going to sort the array. If you look at how computation is done these days, a lot of it, especially when massive data sets are concerned, it doesn't look like that. You don't have one computer, you have many computers. You don't have a data set on just one computer, rather, each computer has a small slice of that data set. All of these computers, this cluster, they all work in tandem in a round of computation on their slice of the data set, and then they aggregate the results at the end of the round. Possibly you can do this multiple times if you want. So probably the best known infrastructure for massive parallel computation of this form is MapReduce, which was developed at Google, originally motivated to compute page rank scores uh, efficiently, but now it's used for lots of other things as well. And now we have many other examples of infrastructures of this type, Hadoop and Spark and so on. So a fundamental question, which is not answered by the traditional theory, is what can and cannot be computed by these new infrastructures for massive parallel computation. 
So one of the real pioneers in asking about their limitations is my colleague Jeff Ullman and many other collaborators, including PhD students in this department. So for example, in addition to a bunch of cool algorithms, they prove some fundamental limitations on what these infrastructures can do. So for problems like, say, matrix multiplication, if you're allowed to use just one or two rounds of these infrastructures for parallel computation, they identified optimal trade-offs between the amount of replication or equivalently the number of machines you use and how much communication is required. So I got interested in this problem recently, and this is with one of my current PhD students, Josh Wang, and a previous graduate of the department, Sergei Veselovitsky, and we were able to finally prove something which had been folklore knowledge to practitioners using the systems, which is while there are computational problems which seem to be right in the wheelhouse of these infrastructures, things like matrix multiplication, page rank computations, there were other problems that just empirically at least didn't seem like a great fit for this infrastructure. It didn't really help you solve it as quickly as you'd like. So the first time we've really identified, we've proved in a formal sense, that there are lots of really pretty simple problems, even things like graph connectivity, which simply cannot be solved as quickly as you'd wanted using these infrastructures. Even though you have thousands and thousands of machines available, the number of rounds of computation required to solve these problems must scale with the input size. You cannot just do it in two or five or a small number of rounds. Okay, so these are new impossibility results for these new models of computation, where the previous models were really just not sufficient. Okay, totally different application. So this is something on the boundary of economics, which has been an interest of mine pretty much my whole career. So the last thing I want to tell you about is how many different members of this department have left an imprint on a really large scale and novel auction, which is going to be run by the government, by the FCC, uh, uh, supposedly next year. So you may or may not know that the way that wireless telecommunication companies have generally acquired spectrum, so licenses the right to broadcast on spectrum, is through auctions that are run by the government, specifically by the FCC. Okay, so this has been happening for decades, where telecoms can compete with each other in government auctions to get these licenses. So that's an old idea, but something has happened very recently that's thickened the plot and made things really interesting, which is that the bulk of the spectrum, which is really juicy for wireless broadband applications, is really kind of all accounted for. It's already held by other owners. So if Verizon and Sprint want to acquire more of these licenses, they have to be taken away from someone else. So the proposal, and the plan is for this auction to be run in 2016, it's going to be a double auction where the government will be both not just selling but also buying. So the goal is to buy existing licenses away from people who have them but can't extract a lot of value from them. So think canonically of like a mom and pop television broadcaster. And then we'll turn around and resell those licenses to companies that can get much greater value out of them. So presumably, uh, you know, telecommunication companies. And the numbers that we're talking about here are pretty big. We're talking about like tens of billions of dollars, both to buy back licenses from television broadcasters, and then also the hope is to make that back and more uh, in revenue from uh, wireless companies. And uh, actually, the numbers are so big that Congress was actually, you know, quite excited to pass a bill authorizing this FCC auction. It's actually the bill that passed this is called the Middle Class Tax Relief <laughs> and Job Creation Act. Because, you know, you know who, are you really going to vote no on a bill <laughs> called the Middle Class Tax Relief and Creation Act? No. But anyway, so it's, it's called the Spectrum Act for short, but this is what actually authorized uh, the FCC to run this auction, which is meant to happen uh, next year. So what does this have to do with Stanford CS? Well, really a lot more than you might think. Okay, so designing this auction, this double auction, this is a hard engineering problem. And the team which has been uh, leading the design, it's two economists at Stanford. So Paul Milgram and Ilya Segal. And they've put together what I think is a really nice proposed design. And the fingerprints of members of this department are visible in many parts of this proposal. So first of all, one thing you have to get right is the incentives. So this is echoing issues that Yuri and Balaji mentioned about earlier this morning. You want to design the auction so that there's no incentive to game the system, so that the participants uh, are incentivized to just behave in a straightforward, transparent way. And the way that's proposed to solve that in this auction design builds on work of my very first PhD student, Mukun Sundarajan, from several years back. There's also issues on the computation side. So one issue is when you're buying back licenses from television broadcasters, you need to figure out what order in which to buy licenses back from. So who do you buy back from first? So that essentially boils down to the design of greedy heuristics. And my colleague Yoav Shoam, in the context of auctions about 10 years ago, developed theory that helps you reason about the trade-offs you face in those greedy heuristic design problems. And exactly those same trade-offs, exactly that same theory is relevant for this double auction design that's going to be run next year. Finally, believe it or not, 
the proposed double auction design, for it to be computationally viable, it actually has to solve NP-complete problems, like graph coloring type problems, at moderate scale. So for graphs that have you know, thousands of vertices, maybe even tens of thousands of vertices. It needs to solve problems like that in something like a half a second. And so part of the team, the FCC's team, is a previous graduate of this department, Kevin Leighton Brown, who was a student of Shoham's about 10 years ago, who's an expert in empirically solving NP-complete problems. And really, they need the full toolbox coming from computer science for empirically good algorithms for NP-complete problems for this to be a computationally viable format. So I think I'm out of time. Uh, so just to wrap up, it's a really fun time to be in theory, in particular at Stanford. The group is as vibrant uh, as it's been in a long time. It's a feel on the one hand, it's anchored by these deep questions about computation that are not going anywhere anytime soon. But it's also constantly nourished by these new applications, which of course are everywhere in computer science. Thanks very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.